Okay, welcome everybody to uh, another edition of Squash Canada's Coach PD webinar series. We're thrilled to have everybody here today for a, a great topic uh, titled What You Really Need to Know About Safe Sport and Complaints. I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail, uh, but I will uh, intro our uh, presenter today, Lise McLean. She's an HR professional with uh, a background in safe sport, and she's going to get into a little more of that uh, uh, very shortly. But I uh, just want to highlight a couple of the topics, you know, review of safe sport, some of the trends, complaint management, et cetera. And Lisa's going to get into that in some great detail uh, over the course of the next 45, uh, 45 minutes to 60 minutes. If you have any questions uh, with a small group, please don't hesitate to uh, unmute and uh, turn on your webcam and uh, ask your questions as we go, uh, go along through the presentation. Uh, the more engagement, the better. And uh, we hope you enjoy today's uh, today's session. So I'm going to turn it over to Lise and uh, enjoy today's uh, presentation. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and welcome everybody on this beautiful first day of February. So, so as, um, as Jeff mentioned, I am, uh, background is in human resources. And I kind of stumbled into safe sport when Swimming Canada was looking for an HR professional just as they were growing. And I ended up with some complaints. And since then, I'm um, really involved in quite a number of sports with complaint intake. And then also further on would be an investigation. And I love to do uh, safe sport training as well. So um, as uh, Jeff alluded to, we're going to do a very quick review of Safe Sport 101. Some of you might have already had Safe Sport training, so I don't want to spend too much time, but maybe talk more about the future and some of the trends. And then we will talk about complaint management. And to me, this is a very useful thing because you can use it in a variety of roles. This is generic. What would I do if somebody came to me with an issue or a dispute? or a complaint, what would I do? And then just in case, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of information on what happens if a complaint is made against you. And um, we'll put it together with some scenarios and question and answers. And as Jeff said, it's a very small group. So please feel free to jump in. Um, you don't have to put your camera on. If you just wanna unmute, that's fine. And if it's a comment, if it's something you've experienced, if you want a challenge, you know, we're really, we're looking to make it interactive. You have different perspectives, um, all of you, than I might have. And I can't see the chat box, uh, but uh, Jeff would be monitoring the chat box if you prefer to, to make comments or questions that way. Okay, here we go. So Safe Sport 101, very quickly, what is Safe Sport? It is the reasonable expectation that a sport environment will be free from all forms of maltreatment. So, you know, no harassment, no bullying, no abuse, no discrimination. But the other part that people sometimes forget about is that it's also accessible, safe, welcoming, and inclusive. So the positive um, embracing the whole community. And safe sport applies to all levels of sport and age groups. So, you know, everything from beginners in the community all the way up to elite internationals. Um, and it's the set of policies and it applies to sports participants. And that could be an administrator, a volunteer, an athlete, a referee, like the, the it, it applies to everybody involved in the sport. So um, it's, Lots of different names for bad behavior. And sometimes if you've had workplace training on harassment in the workplace or respect in the workplace, you hear about this. Some of these terms, you know, like hazing, um, you see in the media, some of these terms are actually criminal code offenses, you know, sexual exploitation, and some are newer comments, uh, you know, like body shame is a fairly new uh, concept. And um, the good thing with um, safe sport is at least um, we're moving to a common language. So the universal code of conduct that is um, adopted by national sporting organizations, including Squash Canada, um, and it, it, uh, it uh, applies to everybody in the sport, as I mentioned, athletes, coaches, volunteers. And so 
um, I won't go to these into detail. I'm just going to show you the broad categories of what is maltreatment, and it could be psychological, physical, neglect. They've got grooming, and there's a separate category. Boundary transgression is something that's kind of a little bit borderline, but not quite behavior. And then on the right hand, uh, right column is all the the process ones, you know, um, not cooperating with the process or getting back at somebody for making a complaint or um, exposing somebody to risk. So some of the categories might, um, bad behaviors might have more than one label to it. But the important thing is the umbrella term maltreatment, and it means volitional acts having to do it on purpose. They result in the potential for harm or, um, or you know, through a series or the risk of harm. Okay. So these are some of the trends that I am seeing. Um, and that's as the intake officer for nine sports, right? So I'm like seeing people phone, people email, here are some of the things that I'm seeing. So one big um, movement is instead of having 54 sports with independent third parties like me doing complaint management and doing applying different policies, they have one same central body, um, the Sport Integrity Commissioner or Abuse Free Sport, and they're going to be doing the complaint intake and management. Um, right now, they're only doing it for national level athletes, you know, elite participants. So basically, we still need our own safe sport policies and procedures at the club level or the provincial level, and for the 95% of participants that aren't elite level athletes. There is more awareness of, you know, safe sport issues are very, very often in the news. Um, typically, it's how like complaint was managed um, improperly but more awareness as well on the prevention, focusing on prevention. I have seen a higher volume of complaints in the years that I've done this. So as people become aware of it, or they're starting to test the system or to trust the system, they would be making more complaints. Complainants might access several avenues for the same issue. So let's say, you know, an event, um, an incident happens, at a local squash club. And it's like, well, they might contact the owner of the facility, they might go to the city, they might go to the uh, provincial squash organization, they might come to me, they might use multiple um, avenues uh, for the same issues. I am seeing uh, more on body shaming, weight management, you know, improper comments on, on what you're eating and how you're managing weight. And particularly like in the aesthetic sports, like artistic swimming or skating comments on, you know, weight management, there's more um, complaints and concerns raised about racism, including systemic discrimination. It's like, well, not the individual, but the whole community or the whole sport is not inclusive as they could be. Um, I am seeing a couple of cases of deliberate misuse of the complaint process. And the good news on this list is there's more focus on prevention, training, screening. So it's like a lot more webinars, a lot more mandatory training, um, more discussions, more guidance, um, really trying to, instead of dealing with high profile, messy cases at the end is, well, let's just educate people and try to prevent this um, at the outset. So here we are. Um, Here's the quiz. So a 13 year old athlete shows up late for practice. The coach tells the athlete that since they're not serious about training, they won't be allowed to practice today. So this is coach's behavior. Is this acceptable coaching practice? Is it psychological maltreatment, neglect, physical maltreatment, or not sure, it depends. So I don't know if you wanna put your answers in the chat box or jump offline and tell me what you think. What do we think? Is there anything in the chat box, Jeff? 
I don't. Uh, oh, yep. Here we go. Uh, one person has said coach should ask why late. Uh, and then it depends. Yeah. Okay. Right, so we've got one for asking more questions and one it depends. Anybody uh, else want to say something there? Okay. So um, I would say it depends is probably the right answer because it could be an acceptable coaching practice, but it could be psychological maltreatment. Um, it wouldn't be physical maltreatment. And when the person who said, well, ask why they're late, get more information. And that's typically what you would do and what I do when I get a complaint. So some things to ask is, you know, how did the coach deliver this to the kid? Was it respectful or did they yell at them in front of the group? Is there some kind of a rule or athlete agreement that allows for this? What was the purpose for the person being late? You know, was the youth warned or is this the first time? Um, and, and, you know, is this just amateur or is this a high performance environment where the standards might be different? So depending on the circumstances, it could be maltreatment or it could be an acceptable coaching practice. Okay, excellent. So now I'm moving um, to complaint management 101, sort of the, this is generic where you're a third party, maybe, you know, a manager or an administrator or just involved somehow, and you're dealing with, with the complaints. So this, you can use this in everyday life and hopefully you will gain from this. So complaint intake, I call it complaint intake. Some people call it triage or screening. It's basically the first time you become aware of potential wrongdoing, no matter the nature of the complaint. So you can find out about it a lot of ways. Sometimes somebody might talk to you, a face-to-face -face discussion. Can I talk to you about something when they let you know? And that's really great. That's a great um, trust in you that they think you're responsible and caring and will do the right thing. They're trusting you and taking that chance with sharing something sensitive. Um, sometimes it could be a letter or an email or through somebody's website contact us page. Or sometimes you personally observe something that you think, hmm, I can't believe they said that or that doesn't sound right or it doesn't like that tone. So you're involved just because you happen to be an observer. Um, you can sometimes learn about it through a social media post or a third party. I often have people come to me to say, I want to talk to you about a friend. My friend experienced this. And it's like, it may well be they're talking about themselves or they actually are coming about a third party. Either way, um, they're coming forward to make a complaint and anonymously where somebody creates a fictitious account or, you know, puts a little envelope under the door. So anyway, this is how you first uh, become aware of things. So you have this and you have to deal something with it. You can't just ignore it, right? So I'm going to start first with it when somebody takes the time to speak to you directly. And you would want to, you know, provide reassurance and listen carefully and trying not to interrupt. And sometimes it's hard because they're speaking very quickly or the emotional and you're not really following the story, but just do your best to listen. You're going to empathize, but remain neutral. Um, you don't want to interject with your opinions. You just want to be an active listener. And if you can take some verbatim notes of the most important details, your primary thing is to, is to focus on the person as they're giving the disclosure. But if you can, on your piece of paper, jot down a couple of key words or, you know, put them into your phone. Um, and an example of a key word is if they're talking about um, psychological maltreatment and they're like, the guy screamed at the top of his lungs, that would be the part you'd say, the guy screamed at top of lungs versus, you know, later on it was, well, did they shout or did they just raise their voice? Like whatever. So screamed at the top of the lungs is kind of relevant to that complaint. And then once they are done telling the story, you can ask them follow-up and clarifying questions. And here it's not, you're not doing an investigation and trying to decide, you know, who's right, who's wrong. You're just trying to get a little bit more detail. So from there you can figure out, well, what do I do with it next? Right? So you might ask, 
when did this happen? Where did it happen? Did anybody see you? Um, how old were you is very important because sometimes if the person is a minor when it happened, you're going to deal with things one way. And if the person is an old, older, then it's going to be a different way of dealing with it. And then asking um, if, any, if you've told anybody else about this and what are you hoping will happen? How can I help? Um, this is important because depending what they say will affect what you do next. So if they're like, well, this is the worst person ever and I want them to be fired versus the, um, I just want an apology. Or I just don't want it to happen again. Or I'm just having a bad day and I'm just venting. So their response there will give you some ideas on what to do next. So again, during the complaint intake, you're going to thank them for sharing, recognizing it's not easy to come forward. You know, thanks for sharing, very, you know, happy you came to me. Tell them you're committed to keeping them safe. And by default, you have some time to think about what to do by default. Um, you wanna make sure you handle it right, you have the full information, but sometimes you need to take immediate measures if there's a risk of harm. So if it's like, um, a child is saying, well, my parents beat me and they're about to jump into the minivan with the, the parents who are alleged to have beaten them, you're going to have to take more immediate action. But most time you can take um, some time to reflect and figure out what to do next. So tell them when you'll get back to them. This is very serious. I want to make sure I do it properly and get permission to share. So it's like, you can say, I haven't got very much experience with this. Is it okay if I talk to so-and-so about this and I won't give the details, I'll leave out your name to let them know, right? Because most people assume, oh, you're speaking in confidence, right? So if you have to speak to somebody else, you want to not break the person's trust and check with them first. Um, and then while the person's left and things are still fresh in your mind, that's where you're going to add the extra details that you remember from the conversation. Um, you're going to review your policies, if you have any, and um, if you can, obtain advice, right? You don't have experience with this. Who can you talk to who might be able to have more background? So um, during the disclosure, uh, try not to get too many details, you know, overwhelm them. It's not an investigation. This is just kind of figuring out what to do with it. And the other thing is I talked earlier about being neutral, empathizing, but being neutral, you don't want to make judgments or commitments. You know, he's a terrible coach. We'll never make sure he never coaches again because there's always two sides of the story, right? So you're getting one side from, you know, an emotional person sometimes with their perspective. And it's like, you can't commit or make any findings because you want to keep an open mind. And don't promise to keep the matter confidential because sometimes you just can't. And then after the disclosure, don't tell the person, hey, do you know so-and-so just came in and complained about you? Don't do that. And don't um, allow the complainant, the person who came to see you to return the care of the person they complained about if there's a, a risk of harm. All right. So you have your, your complaint, your intake, and now you're kind of, well, what do I do with this? I know about this information, hmm, what do I do? And so I kind of break it down and there's a couple of different paths. So one would be informal resolution. You just try to resolve it informally, you chat, you have somebody help to have a meaningful discussion. I'll go into more details later. That's the option number one. Option number two is, Hmm. We might have to do more fact finding. We might need some kind of a disciplinary process. We need somebody to look into this. And the third is referring to others. That might be like, I don't have authority to look at this, but I know who does, or this actually belongs to another organization. Or sometimes um, the referral is to resources or support. The, the person who sees you has an issue, but they're just so, you know, challenged um, and having, they need, you know, mental health resources or support, or they need addiction support or something else in order for them to be well enough to be able to proceed with the complaint. So sometimes you refer off to others and very, very rarely, you actually don't have to do anything. The file is closed. So for instance, if the person came and it was a minor incident and they're just 
I'm venting. And you ask, what do you want me to do to follow up? Oh, nothing. I just want to vent. You might be able to just, depending on what it is, take very good notes and let that file disappear with the understanding if that issue comes up again, you would have to go and, and take further action. You, I always have a rule, and I'm an HR practitioner where a lot of people come to see me with issues with other people. And it's like, my rule is, well, you can vent about something once, and if you come and vent about it the second time, then that's time for us. We need to do something to resolve. So Lise, we've had a question in the chat. Uh, sure. I know. Uh, assume it was referring to the previous slide it says yeah. do do we train staff to do this or have them refer the complainant uh so in this specific case uh to the person is the executive director slash president uh spider i don't know if you want to expand on that question yes hi spider jones with uh, nwt uh, squash yeah so i mean it's all very pertinent but do i have our staff sort of uh you know, be trained in the response techniques and um, questions, or do we sort of refer them to to me or whomever? Or, or maybe I have a section on the website called Safe Sport that says, you know, um, you have you a complaint, um, contact so and so at so and so, and then also list our Safe Sport policies. Um, you know, we we want to give the best support to whoever's making a complaint, yeah. but still need um, you know. Uh, a process followed and none of these and, and not have a step missed in the process. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So it's kind of like how many um, gatekeepers do we have to the process? And um, what I say is it doesn't hurt for the more people to have this kind of training informally, right? Because they can use it in other places as well. And what you want is multiple sources of entry. So it's like, if you have one person's name listed, all your complaints might go here and the person isn't comfortable speaking to that person, you've closed the door. So it's like, if you can have, you can talk to the CEO, you can talk to the independent third party, you can talk to the, you know, somebody. So you give a couple of options for um, people to access the complaint process and you make sure those three names know they're the point person and also have consistent training so that if the individual went to person A, B, or C, the response should be similar. Um, and what I, I'm seeing more and more is like organizations are pushing down the basic training, the basic policies to a lower level so that you can go colleague to colleague, athlete to athlete, and the person will know the basics, like I would call that the basics, what I said, you know, listen carefully, take some notes, tell them you'll get back into them. That doesn't mean they have authority to handle that complaint. That just means they're going to be doing complaint intake. And if it means following up with somebody who's in a position to deal with it, um, that's fine. But that's the broadest system. It gets the most complaints, the most options for people who have issues to come at the lowest level. And it's like when for the Olympics, they uh, train a lot of people, you know, as safe sport officers, kind of intake people. It's like some were physiotherapists, you know, some were team captains. And a lot of people got the basic training. But there are only a few who had the, you know, detailed knowledge of the, if you can think of the Olympics, how complicated the policies would be, right? Because it's international and there's this policy and international law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the complicated parts, they trained a few people, but from the um, openness and the basic training, more people had the training. Sarah, yes, I mean, I, I saw that some of the questions you encouraged being asked on your slide is there a sort of a template or a one pager that um you know we 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 could solicit and then have pass that out to you know folks in within the organization that you know might be receiving these calls so that we can then sort of ask that questions that initial triage and then yeah. maybe at the end of it say you know this uh you know we take all all concerns complaints seriously you know this will now be passed to and and so there's a a, a pseudo script for the stuff that that we say to help reassure and so forth 
but also uh, something that would then we fill in the blanks for questions that we really want to try to get some early answers to. Yeah. And I mean, these slides will be shared by um, by Jeff to everybody. I wanted them to go out at the end of the presentation so you're not distracted. Um, and in sure. terms of other generic resources, um, it's amazing how much is out there on the web that wasn't there before. You know, so via sport, for instance, they've got a complaint intake form, et cetera, et cetera. And if you need more resources or more material, um, I think you've got my contact information. But uh, yeah, yeah, to start out with something basic that, you know, people have have some idea on what to do and conversely what not to do, right? When somebody makes a commitment and says, oh, I'm going to stop that person, we'll never do that again. And they have prejudged the case without having all the information, you know, that doesn't support a, a safe sport process either. So, Thank you. So when we go back to complaint intake and we look at our kind of our streams, informal resolution, alternate dispute resolution, it sounds like a fancy legal title, but what it is, it's a variety of techniques to prevent, manage, and resolve disputes informally. You know, keep it, keep it simple, keep it informal, don't pay for a lawyer or an investigator, try to manage it yourselves. So examples are conflict coaching. Conflict coaching is somebody comes to see you and they have an issue and you just support them to have the discussion directly. Well, what would you say if, if Bob was in the room? Okay, what would be a good time to talk to Bob, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of coach them on having the, the discussion. So that's the simplest and easiest, but not everybody's comfortable with that. The next would be a facilitated discussion where you have the, the person who's complaining and the other person with the issue, and you'll have a neutral third party to be in the room to make people feel safe, you know, to take notes, to help, help having a meaningful discussion. And then from there, you can get people with more um, experience in mediation, like a more formal mediation process. So that, that whole range. And one of the things I think it's, is useful for any, you know, uh, sport organization as you're getting your skill set is to have some people and provide some background in informal resolution because a lot of time if you can get the people together at an early stage and equip them to have a discussion you're going to prevent escalation and formal complaints right by having a large variety of people who can just manage these issues with that skill set um, it reduced the costs and negative consequences to do it informally it's usually faster, but the parties need to agree to this approach. So if you have one party and it's like, no, I don't want to talk to them. I absolutely want to throw the book at him. This is unacceptable. No, no, no. Then you're not going to be able to have it. The parties have to agree to this approach. And what's different is if you do the formal process with a disciplinary hearing or an investigation, there's a winner and there's a loser. Either the person believed the complaint happened or it didn't. Either there's disciplinary actions or there isn't. So one party is almost always disappointed with the results of a formal complaint process. With informal resolution, there's a lot more options available. You can brainstorm and think about this and think about this and talk about this. And there's different options. You know, can I get an apology? How about training? Hey, you know what? Let's do training for everybody because this is a good idea or, or whatever, right? So that opportunity with more options and the parties have to agree to it. And if it's like the agreement is training for the individual, training for the club and an apology and everybody's happy with that, uh, win, win, win. And um, it's a great option for many interpersonal issues and minor complaints, but you have to be careful because sometimes you're not even allowed to use informal resolution for certain types of complaints. So for instance, sometimes for sexual harassment, it automatically has to go to an investigation. So check your policies, but overall, if you can try with informal resolution first. So that's the first bucket. And then um, related to this is the duty to report. So uh, you have a legal duty to report suspected child abuse to child protection authorities and the police. So this varies by occupation and province. You know, very typically, you know, it's like police officers and 
educators and, you know, uh, physicians or social workers, they have mandatory obligations to report. And the UCCMS, the Universal Code of Conduct, reinforces this. And they say, you know what, even if you're not in a profession in a province where there might be child abuse, we have a moral and ethical duty to report it using the, the final, um, using the appropriate measures, right? So, and um, so that's the first one formal. Um, and then in for, pardon me, disciplinary panel would be if you um, have a, like a, somebody else is going to determine if there was maltreatment or not, right? As I talked about, somebody impartial is gonna get both sides of the story, write a report, make a decision. And then the third one was referring to others. And so there, if it isn't your organization who's responsible or you don't have authority to do it, then you want to hand off. And uh, one best practice is to make sure the handoff occurs. So if the individual, and you said here, you know, you're going to follow up and say, did you phone the, um, the helpline I gave you? Did, were you happy with the results or do you want me to give you another resource? Or if it belongs to another organization, you say, well, do you want me to email so-and-so and copy you on it? Or do you want to contact them yourself? And then the next day you're gonna follow up and say, well, did you make your complaint to that organization? And did they hear back? So when you refer off to follow up. And I guess one final message is we're, you know, sometimes worried about not getting it 100% right. And basically, in most cases, if you use common sense, if you come from it from a background of good faith, I just want to do the right thing, you'll be fine, right? So the only thing would be to ignore it, to not do anything. If you're not sure and you still do something to the best of your knowledge and skills and ability, that's exactly what we need. Do something. So um, any questions or comments or discussion on that before we move to the next section, which is complaints against you? Yes. Questions? Sorry, sorry Spider here again from NVT Squash. Um, yeah. I asked whether our, what, our, what our obligations are to report and when and in what circumstances are we obliged to report to Sport Canada and or Squash Canada? Okay, so the reporting mechanism, um, it sort of depends on what it is. So if it's kind of the child abuse or anything that's, you know, against um, a child, then that would be towards your uh, provincial or territorial um, agency. So I think if you put, you know, child abuse and you put your province or territory and Google it, you'll get the phone number on who to report it to. And then if you see other kind of bad behavior, the reporting depends, but the rule is basically at the lowest possible level. So if you see one club member kind of verbally abusing another one, you would start by default. Um, well, first of all, you could potentially get involved yourself and say, stand up and say, I didn't think that was very appropriate. So you can get involved directly. And if not, you would report it to the club level. And then from there, if it's like, well, if they didn't have authority, um, up it goes. And um, the independent third party for Squash Canada, so you do have an independent third party, they can kind of um, act as the point of contact if people aren't sure and redirect it, right? So if you see something and it was at a provincial event or you're not sure because it happened outside of squash activities, if you're not sure, then you can contact the independent third party for Squash Canada. And from there, they will figure out what to do. Um, and then the new resource, the Sport Integrity Commissioner Office, that would, it's pretty niche. It's for reporting of like national level, like national level athletes against each other or national level, you know, coach athlete, that kind of thing. So it's pretty limited. And uh, we're all trying to work together that, you know, if I get something that's supposed to get to the sport integrity commissioner, I'll hand it off. And likewise, we're all trying to work together to make sure things get to the right place. And we recognize for people who are trying to access the system, it can be confusing right now. We understand. 
but do your best, get it somewhere and it will get redirected if you're not in the right place. Thank you. So the next is what if there's a complaint against you? So um, as I talked about, there's more complaints in the system as become, people become aware of them. They're initiating more of these. And so what I've got here, um, what to expect when a complaint is made against you. And this though, I have to put the caveat, this is an ideal scenario where you've got a good mature organization, they've had training, they're getting good advice. Um, many times, if you are made aware of a complaint, they might not get this full checklist, right? We're all learning how to manage complaints. We're all learning and growing together on the safe sports system. But ideally, if a complaint is made against you, and this would apply for, you know, something, a workplace uh, misconduct, right? If there was an allegation of harassment against you in a workplace, so it's kind of whatever hat you put on, these are the universal qualities. So you should expect a written complaint with specific details of the allegations, who, what, when, right? It, you can't just be accused of, well, you know, you were verbally abusive last year. You have to know, you know, at this board meeting, you said these comments to this person. And then they should tell you a little bit the process to be followed and the policies that apply. They'll give you the link, here it is, here's our discipline and complaint. Um, as the next step, we want to know, do you want to have informal resolution or so-and-so is the case manager? So they should tell you what the process is and they should ask you, are you interested in alternate dispute resolution, informal resolution? And if they do, I would always say, yes, you have nothing to lose by it, right? Um, if the other party is agreeable, try to resolve it first. And if it doesn't work, then the process will continue, but at least try alternate dispute. They should also tell you whether there'll be any interim or temporary measures while the complaint is reviewed. So depending on how serious it is, um, they might have to take uh, temporary measures against you to prevent risk while they review it. If you think about it, like in a workplace, a supervisor might be put on, you know, paid admin leave and isn't going into the workplace. Or it might be that, you know, a certain athlete um, is removed from the team and has to train someplace else. And it's like they have to do that because it's a tough decision, but they're trying to manage the risk. Well, what if there's harm while we review this? And then they will talk about the next steps and names of resources, approximate timelines. You should expect to hear from our investigator so-and-so in five days. They should remind you about confidentiality and they should be reminding everybody involved. Don't talk about this um, other than if you're getting advice, like need to know. don't start um, talking to others about it. And they'll say the respondent or, you know, so the provincial organization has been informed. They should let you know. And they should also say, um, if you take action for this complaint against you, more discipline can happen to you. So the idea is everybody's got the right to make a complaint. And if you take action against somebody for using making a complaint in good faith, you're just going to make the situation worse. And they should also talk about support or resources available to you. So if you are faced with a complaint, um, these are you know, easy words for Lee's to throw on the PowerPoint, but sometimes really hard to do in real life. So you're going to do your best to take it personally, to keep your emotions under control. And it's hard, it's very emotional. Some people have talked about being broadsided or hit by a bus or they're in shock. You know, They're so proud of their professional life and all their energy they've put in and to get hit by something like this, it's really, really um, quite emotionally striking some cases. You can consider consulting with a lawyer or an HR professional and don't try to contact the complainant to say, oh, I'm so sorry you misinterpreted this. Like, can you drop this against me? Don't contact the complainant. Don't talk to potential witnesses. Respect that confidentiality and be cooperative and respectful of the process. You know, when the investigator contacts you, you say, you answer right away and you try to get the earliest date and you make sure you have the documents prepared. Familiarize yourself with the policies and procedures 
And, you know, sometimes they're complicated. So it's okay to ask the independent third party or the investigator, well, what do we mean by this? Or what's this timeline? It's okay to ask questions about the, the procedure. Express willingness in the alternate dispute resolution process. I think I already talked about the benefits of that. And then once you're aware of the complaint against you, that's when you start checking, oh, did I keep that text? Do I have that email? Let me make notes of my inc of that one the um, incidents fresh in my mind, who do I think was there? So start to plan, make a list of your witnesses, make your notes, look for your documents, start to get your ducks in the row. But again, don't contact the witnesses. Okay. And uh, we talked about the witnesses, meet all the timelines of the investigator. Like if, even if you're overwhelmed or you can't do the deadline, at least say, I'm so sorry, this is a very, very bad week at work. Could I have until Monday instead of Friday to give you the documents, right? Um, use neutral, unbiased language in your written statements or interviews. You know, try to do your best to, to use that professional language and to not attack the complainant or, you know, twist or exaggerate. Do your best to use neutral language and make contingency plans for all possible outcomes. You know, start to think, well, worst case scenario, I lose my job. But, you know, I always wanted to start a llama farm, right? So just try to embrace the worst possible outcome, but still hoping for the best possible outcome. You want to secure emotional support and you really, really want to focus on self-care because it's a tough thing to be accused of something, to go through the process. So whatever you normally do, you know, whether it's exercise or meditation or hanging out with friends to keep yourself well, you want to do that even more through a the process okay any questions on the complaint um, if a complaint's made against you before we move to scenarios no okay and i'm keeping an eye on the time we have about 15 minutes left so maybe i'll only do a couple of the scenarios and um, to make sure we have time for questions okay so the first scenario you're a head coach at a community club, an athlete from your club. She's not coached by you. She comes to you crying. She says her teammates are always teasing her and picking on her and that her coach doesn't stop it from happening. She says she can't take it anymore. How do you handle the situation? And yeah, I'd love it if you guys just unmuted and gave a few thoughts. There's no wrong answers here, so. Water here and the squash. I said, I guess I'd say certainly, uh, you know, you know, thank you very much uh, for approaching me. I'm glad you feel comfortable that we can have this conversation. Um, and then start to go through some of those questions that you'd alluded to earlier in the PowerPoint. Right. Yep. yep. So that's that's a good start. Um, seeing about emotional support. You know, do you want to talk to? Do you have a friend or a family you can talk to? Do you have, you know, a the mental health um, hotline. So making sure she has resources. And then um, what's interesting about this situation is she came to you. You're not the person in charge of this, right? So this is kind of what would you do next in terms of where does it go, right? And she came to you and trusted you. So you want to be very careful on not violating her privacy. It's like, well, can I talk to this other person? Can I talk to the club president? You want to be, take it one step at a time to make sure anything you do doesn't violate her trust. And anything else on this one? Yeah. But yeah, you should be proud if people are, are, are confident to come to you um, with issues. That says a lot about you. So the next one, club president, Someone shows you a string of recent social media posts about your club. Current and former athletes have described your club as racist, misogynistic. A former employee says she was fired for speaking up about a particular coach's sexist comments. How do you handle the situation? I guess I'd want to find out where, um, you know, uh, you know, 
get a copy of the you know re respective media posts so they know that you know where they were and when they took place and mm -hmm. maybe who posted them if that's available yeah any other thoughts on this one See, this is kind of like general comments. It's about the culture. And if you have the identities of people, you can follow up and, you know, um, invite them to provide e more details, invite them to make complaints. Because if not, it could just be, you know, rumors that are hurting their reputation and there's nothing to them versus there actually being some, some basis, right? So you would want to encourage the people that you can identify to make, you know, more details. Now, if you only have rumors and innuendo and you can't find anything specific, um, there's something called like a cultural assessment, right? You can have somebody come in and just kind of check, check the environment. You know, is it healthy? Are there um, disrespectful comments? Do people feel welcome and safe? And so the difference between an assessment and, inve and an investigation. So an investigation is person A did this to person B on this date. It happened, yes or no. And the cultural assessment is really broad and it's like, hmm, is this a healthy environment? Are there potential you know, issues with this, this, this? And it's not like right and wrong, they find against one person, they'll just identify, oh yes, you have an issue with this, or maybe you need some training with this, or it's true, you know, your board isn't balanced and consequently your hiring decisions are ending up like this. So that would be a, a cultural assessment that you might want to consider since it's identifying systemic issues. I'd also and, be worried about the, you know, the effect of our brand of our, you know, the name of our club. Yeah. You know, on, on it's, Facebook and is there, um, I mean, whether it's true or not, you know, the, the perception all of a sudden is that, uh, hey, you know, we employ co coaches that behave poorly. Yeah. And sometimes people like will handle the PR part of it separately. Right. Um, I had one with, we, you know, national sporting organizations where it was a sexual assault that happened at an event. And, you know, the organization supposedly turned a blind eye. So there was like step one is look at the situation, assess it. And separately as well, what do we have to do in terms of reputation management and branding? And so it's kind of like the, you know, respond right away to say, you know, this is a zero tolerance environment. We highly value diversity, whatever it is. So the generic, hey, this isn't who we are with, and here are the steps we're taking to address these concerns. Thank you. And scenario number three, it's an email from a parent of a minor athlete. They say they're making a formal complaint against their coach. Their child was injured in a game. The child assessed the injury and insisted the child return to play. A uh, trip to emergency later revealed a, fact, a fracture, and the parents state this coach has a pattern of ignoring athletes when they complain. So they want this coach to be fired and say that other parents feel the same way. And when the um, it, this often happens when people make a complaint and it comes from a lawyer or they have a lawyer's name on it. So that's a lot of detail there. Does anybody have any any thoughts on that? I think one of the steps I'd look at is reviewing uh, the training of our coaches for assessing injuries. Right. Yeah. Uh, reminding them of the, uh, you know, the national coaching certifications programs uh code of conduct for all coaches in canada the uh the do no harm yeah uh, and and see see if they're current on that or, or maybe we have a policy saying that you know they need to take it every three or four years and geez i've noticed that that's uh you haven't taken it for six years um you know as per the patch policy we need everybody uh yeah 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 so i mean in most cases there's a particular case which is one thing you have to deal with. And then um, as you, you did so well, Spider, looking in terms of systemic issues, right? So it's like you have to um, in, have some kind of investigation on this particular complaint and get back to them. But also at the same time, you're right. Oh, what training have we had? Could this happen to others, et cetera? And I mean, 
you um, the presence of the lawyer, it's intimidating, but you should still follow the process. And here you might want to check with your own lawyer if you have one, because it's got the potential of a lawsuit too, right? There's an actual injury, there's, you know, some damages and consequences. And so um, this one, you, you might want to get an extra little bit of advice on that. It's interesting that this scenario sort of is at the other end of the spectrum to the uh, the NCCP's Make Ethical Decisions module, where the scenario that they use in the course training talks about a 13-year-old athlete who, who was, has a, a knee injury, who was who uh, policy says that the parents, uh, they can't be allowed on the back on the field and play until they get uh, a written um letter from from the doctor but you've got yeah. the parents saying no no we spoke to our gp he's fine yeah. uh you know he said uh, he'll be good to go i'll get you the letter the next morning the parents are walking over the registration desk and the parent want him to play the athlete uh probably wants to play and yeah and so they work yeah. through that med uh decision making process based on that scenario but it yeah. seems to be yeah. at the other it's, end it's of, kind of like to the one you're that you damned if you do and you're damned if you don't so if you're too conservative we have to make sure we have medical documentation from a specialist we have to make sure of this then i've had complaints about you know my child was unfairly prevented from participating in the sport you know it wasn't realistic to be able to see the specialist at this time right so it, it's kind of somewhere between making them deliberately play injured and you know having them off for two years until they can have multiple assessments so so somewhere in there but it's definitely um people are more aware of it um and and more attention to well what is the best course of action in these situations and then here is um, a couple of resources on where to find help with complaints. This is complaints generally, if you know you're receiving a complaint or um, it's made against you. So the Coaching Association of Canada has got some resources. Um, and the Canadian Sport Helpline, so that is the Abuse Free Sport. You can phone them and get general advice and resources on complaint management. Um, the Canadian Centre for Mental Health and Sport, that's more resources to support those who are like in the process and might not be doing it well. Uh, Commit to Kids has got great resources on reporting child sexual abuse and inappropriate behavior. So if you got one of those child ones where you're not quite sure, Commit to Kids, that's their specialty. Um, federal Legal Aid, if the complaint is made against you. And another resource is the independent third party or safe sport officer of your of your sport, right? So it's like I often get inquiries it's like well i think they're going to make a complaint against me or i've received this complaint so it's like we serve the process we don't serve complainants respondents we just support the the process generally um, the sdrcc has got lawyers and pro bono program for these are lawyers who want to specialize in sports and so if you have a situation as a complainant respondent as an organization you can reach out to them and then uh, play by the rules dealing with the complaint. This is actually an Australian resource. Um, they're kind of minister of sport, but they've got um, amazing resources in terms of videos on how to handle a complaint, like from beginning to end. And then they've got resources on how to do informal resolution. So there we go. Any questions or comments? We still have a few minutes. I'd love you to get the maximum value out of your presentation. So please. What sort of uh, expense or uh, sort of expenses are we looking at? If we bring on a third uh, independent person like yourself to hire complaints. Is that something that the, the government, federal government has got some funding we can apply to? or that, that you can tap into for the first however many hours, depending on the level of uh, or is that uh, just a conversation sure between on, you and yeah, a PSO? I'm not sure on, on the funding, what is available from the government. Um, and I also know there's a lot of more people are training their own members with complaint intake, right? So instead of having an outside person, they will take a couple of individuals in the organization and give them some training on complaint intake. So it, it sort of depends. There's lots of uh, different models depending on how complex you are. 
Yeah, I guess so. I work for Sport North as well, and I'm and I'm wondering now, you know, should and we've got thirty territorial sport organizations as members, be, because uh, I, I guess the TSO could have that in house, but how uh, independent would be that that be viewed by a complainant, or or is that something possibly Sport North looks at uh, getting somebody in house trained to then um, you know do do intake. Uh, it's a service to its members. It's uh, separate and distinct, so that it's not seen as um, you know, uh, you know, squash handling its own, and you know, could otherwise get swept under the rug. Poor expression. Yeah. I mean, there is definitely a move to having somebody independent um, to do that, right? If you can, but it's like, um, and then there's different models. Some are a flat retainer per year. Uh, me, I'm an hourly. It's like, you know, if you don't use my services, you don't get charged. You only get charged for, you know, per case as people. Um, so there's lots of models out there, but I'm not sure um, what the funding is available. Any other questions? Last call. I think that's it then. Perfect. Thanks, Lise, for a wonderful presentation today on uh, safe sport and complaint management and and the entire, you know, uh, kind of safe sport, uh, you know, portfolio that uh, seems to be changing every day. Uh, we seem to learn something new every day and uh, it'll be different tomorrow, I'm sure. Um, you know, with respect to safe sport and Squash Canada, for those on the call, uh, as many of you will have saw, Squash Canada has officially signed on with uh, OSIC. Uh, we're going through the transition period as we speak. Uh, we will have some policies that will be changing and getting updated uh, as we go uh, through the motions here in the, the next few days and few weeks. Uh, we have formally adopted <clears throat> the UCCMS. Um, it needs to be uh, the policy uh, as is. It, we currently have it integrated in our code of conduct. So we uh, essentially have now adopted it as it's uh, as it's uh, written, and uh, we'll have a new code of conduct. So many changes coming for Squash Canada as uh, any other NSO, and uh, so stay tuned for many of those uh, things coming forward. Um, with that being said, again, Lise, thank you for your presentation today. For those on the call, just a reminder, we've got three more webinars coming up over the next couple of months. There is another one scheduled for next Wednesday, uh, February 8th. And uh, it's titled, What's So Different About Coaching Adults, Specifically Masters Athletes? Then we have uh, a couple in April. One of them is on female athletes' health, adding the X's and O's, and then another one on developing a mindfulness practice. So if you're interested in those, uh, please uh, get registered or share it uh, you know, through to your uh, membership so we get lots of uh, registrations. And uh, we look forward to seeing on those uh, webinars in the coming weeks. Otherwise, thank you again for attending today, and uh, we will uh, see you on the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lise. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers.